If I could have your attention, please, I would like to all, welcome all of you to the uh, 2017 or 2018 Winter Lecture Series. Uh, this is the sixth year that we have had the Winter Lecture Series, which began through the Great Stone Viaduct Society, uh, that is an organization uh, for the LR Ohio that has acquired part of the uh, Great Stone Viaduct. And part of our mission is to provide um, education. The name of our society is the Great Stone Viaduct Historical Education Society. So one of the things that we have done is to create this winter lecture series where eight weeks, February and March of every year, on Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock, and I believe that's what this is right now, uh, we have presentations on local historical topics or topics of interest relating to history. And uh, this particular uh, year, we've decided that we would take some of those uh, lectures on the road, so to speak. Uh, we normally have these at the Beller Public Library, and six of this year's eight presentations are going to be at the Beller Public Library. Uh, but this one is on the road here at Ohio University, and we welcome you all. Uh, Erica or I will be announcing what some of those uh, presentations will be after this evening. Uh, because we'd like to have you attend. Uh, we think that the topics are, are timely and uh, of historical import. If you enjoy local history, you'll enjoy the lecture series. And tonight, uh, Professor Mike McKegg is going to be telling us all about Ohio University here in Belmont County. How many folks that are here this evening, could you just raise your hands, how many folks have attended this campus? How many did I teach? <laughs> Thank you. You know, I start, there are some folks who started here earlier than I, but I, I took my first class here at a high university in 1970. And I can recall just a few times where I've been in this auditorium. Um, one was when I spoke uh, to a group of uh, incoming students uh, Dean Newton had some former graduates come and talk to students, and I attended here for that and was here at this podium. Uh, but the most memorable of the times when I was in this auditorium was when I was sitting out there where you are this evening. And I can remember a packed auditorium when we had a guest speaker whose name was Christine Jorgensen. Do you recall that? Oh, yeah. Christine Jorgensen. How many people know who Christine Jorgensen is? If you don't know, you can look it up. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but it's a very timely topic today. And back in the early 70s, we had such a fine university here that we were able, through the lecture series that was sponsored here, to have speakers of this caliber on timely and important issues that were presented to the students at this campus. Um, I can only tell you that Mike is the reason why I was guided in the direction that I went, which was uh, into the law. And if Harry White were, tell were here tonight, he would tell you, so that is who we blame. <laughs> <laughs> but Mike is known by everyone. He's been a teacher in the classroom. He's been an administrator. He has been a positive force for Ohio University for more years than what he has said I can say. <laughs> so without further ado, I'd like to have Mike take the podium and to ex tell you all about how Ohio University has had an impact and a great effect on so many people here uh, living in Belmont County. Mike. Okay, thank you. First of all, I'd like to welcome you to Ohio University and to the Eastern Campus. Uh, it is uh, a distinct pleasure of mine to be able to make this presentation because uh, I am a living fossil at this institution. Uh, I'm older than dirt. I was here before the building was here, and I plan to be here. I think I'll have them lay me in state out there in the <laughs> Northex and just see if that kind of carries over a storyline. Uh, I always like to begin with one small statement. I read it so I don't mess it up. But it says, I shall be telling this tale with a sigh, remembering ages and ages hence 
two roads diverge in a wood. And I, I took the one less traveled. And it made all the difference. And I cry every time. So, <laughs> welcome to Ohio University. I came here <clears throat> unannounced and unwelcome. We opened the building, and at the time, we had already been in Martins Ferry. We went to St. Clairsville High School. We went to the old sanitarium, and then we began the building process here. So I have fond memories. I did not teach in Martins Ferry. Uh, but the man who was going to be my mentor, Bob Bovenizer, said that uh, uh, they could use some additional staff. So I was sent from Athens. He did not recruit me, and he couldn't throw me away. So when I came here, there were four of us. Bob Bovenizer, an associate, Tom Stubbs, Catherine Tedrick, who had been secretary of Green Pit Steel, whose brother, Bob Forsyth, is the architect of the Hall of Fame in Canton, but also is the architect of this building, and myself. And you'll see a picture of us. I had hair. Uh, I had a little bit uh, of a different color set. But the four of us started before we decided to hire the full faculty. Uh, we'd eventually have uh, a relatively uh, eclectic group, a really lovely group of people from a variety of backgrounds. But let me give you a small statement about who Bob Bovenizer was and where he came from as well, quickly. Bob Bovenizer was, in a sense, uh, an associate in Athens to the man who was in charge of all regional campuses, a man by the name of Al Gubitz, and Bob Bovenizer was his assistant. Bob was charged with developing satellite campuses. So he developed campuses at Lockhorn Air Force Base in Columbus, Blytheville, Arkansas, and outside of Houston, Texas. They were all what were called Operation Bootstraps, guys in the service that were going to come back and take courses. And then we were starting to see that it was considered possible that we would have regional sites. And he was given an opportunity as a choice where he might like to go. There was already a Portsmouth site. There was about to be additional sites. This would be one called Belmont County. It's one of the few sites that did not have a city attached to it. So we were the county. Uh, when it was set up here, uh, it would later go to Zanesville, then to Chillicothe, and finally Southern, which is down in Ironton, Ohio. And we encompass one third of the state of Ohio. Ohio University does. Uh, we also had uh, a mission statement, which was to have students come, get a liberal arts education, and they could stay for two years and transfer to the main campus. As time goes on, it became a four-year degree-granting institution with graduate courses, with a variety of experimental concepts, weekend college, courses over the air. We developed an Ohio University Learning Network. Uh, just as an aside, I taught a class Sunday mornings at 6 o'clock on the radio, uh, and it was broadcast a half hour at a time. Would you get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to hear anybody, uh, let alone me? Uh, but we would try a little of everything. Uh, we had experiential learning. We tried a variety of fun and had a great time uh, developing. So we've always been something of an experimental site. To that end, uh, when Bob comes, uh, he has a cadre of friends. And many of them uh, are partly related to people here in the audience. But my friend, Mr. Bartles, there was a Bill Bartles who was director of student teaching. And there was a guy by the name of Bud Kaiser who got into the vocation school. And eventually, uh, along with John Shannon, who had been the county superintendent, along with Earl Greer, they were friends. And they knew each other. And they knew all the superintendents. And everybody who or less supported all the educational programs. Uh, it took off in, a, in an idea. This was going to be an, ex an educational park. Eventually, the land was donated by the Consult Coal Company, 360 plus acres, and uh, we were off. Now, we would have done more courses at the old sanitarium, but parents didn't want to have their kids go there because Disease. they were going to get tuberculosis, and that was not going to be the case. It had been desensitized, but you couldn't convince them otherwise, so we had to give that one up. When we put this campus together, some of you are saying, I'm coming back, it doesn't look the same. Once upon a time, you could only drive up to the circle, and then it stopped. We have since put a road all the way around, an upper parking lot. Uh, from the time this place started, this was the building. Then came a science and engineering building, and eventually came uh, uh, a center, which I will use the correct name, the Ney Center. Uh, it is not Haypeck. 
Health and of Physical Education Center. Bob Nay was highly instrumental in trying to get this here. Partly at the insistence of a guy by the name of Mike Mormanis, who was a phys ed teacher here who just drove everybody nuts saying we ought to have a place to actually have athletic programs. Uh, on the campus is an old tavern called the Lentz Tavern, a one-room schoolhouse, a McGuffey Reader Schoolhouse. We have a covered bridge to the back side, and it is out front, although you can't see it, is the possibility of an arboretum. This was an experimental apple orchard and a, a farm. You know, It was part of the extension office. So the campus has a, a strong tradition and a long history. Out in the middle of nowhere is Dysart Woods, uh, which is another collection, primeval forest, 50 acres, a lovely facility. So when putting all that together, this is a unique site. Everybody else was in the town, and we for an idea that we represented everybody in eastern Ohio. The idea was that it was some kind of a place where we were the liberal arts institution for this side of the river. Since then, it's hard to imagine any place having more educational institutions. You have Miami, or Muskingum College, you have uh, down in uh, Marietta, you have West Liberty, you have Bethany, you have West Virginia Northern, you have Eastern Gateway, you have Franciscan, you can get Washington and Jefferson, there's WVU uh, sends a uh, satellite, and everybody more or less was available for faculty. So our campus became somewhere between 75 and 90 people that we would hire to come and teach our courses. We had marvelous instructors coming from all these institutions. The cream of the crop, they were wonderful. John Kerry from Steubenville, uh, you couldn't get better. Uh, they were just wonderful people. So while our faculty, at, originally about 28 of us, eventually blossomed. And we had what we thought was a class A faculty, something that was dynamic. And it kind of started and worked its way through. So Jay, if you would, let me run this here contraption. Uh, after I do a little bit of this. So, just tell me which one of these damnable buttons is the one I want to push. Okay. All right, so. That one on the right. Okay. I want to go back, right? So, this would have been the sanitarium. You had a four building and an aft building and a small administrative hall. And it was a lovely setting, and it could have worked out for a long range, but it wasn't to be. We were there just a short time, and we had to give it back to the county commission. It seemed to be reasonable that they would have access to other kinds of facilities. We're jumping all over the place, but when we were building, and that's Shannon Hall up here, there's Mike Romanis and Bob Bovenizer. This is the tennis court that was on the driveway as you come up. Uh, it has since been removed, but once upon a time, we thought we ought to have some kind of physical activity, and the tennis court seemed to be one of those. Dang, go on, back up. All right, there's our covered bridge. The bridge came from Fairfield, Ohio. Dick Bacavella, the county engineer, said, hey, I've got a covered bridge. Would you like it? We said, certainly, because they were a, you know, a dying source of history. We wanted to preserve it. It's about 66 feet long, about oh, 10 and a half feet tall. People want to come and get married down there. They like the idea of a nice, tranquil setting. There's a little pond beside. Uh, you can still fish there. We don't tell everybody that, but you can do it if you care to do so. Uh, and it is now kind of held advanced. Above it, although there's not a picture, there was a glass greenhouse. Do you remember the greenhouse, anybody? Yeah. Whose house was it? Cool. Lady Bird Johnson, the highway beautification program. And plants and flora and fauna, and she was desperate to get rid of billboards. She wanted to take them all down. Didn't like the idea. Here's the beginning of our dedication ceremony. This would be the faculty standing in traditional garb. Uh, this was the road that came up. You made the circle. You didn't make the full drive. Uh, there's Bob Bovenizer addressing. We had Vern Allen, president of the university. We had dignitaries from the Board of Regents. We had our own board of trustees, others. But we had some special people. Uh, our coordinating council has always been an advisory body to the campus, and we've had some marvelous people. Uh, we've had from the coal companies, the Heslips and the Hatch uh, contingent. We had quiet uh, assistance coming from people like Jim Riley, uh, who was vice president in, in Consol as well. We had individuals like Jim or John Kirk from Barnesville. We had uh, Dick Sambuco coming down. We had all kinds of people that were at one time or another instrumental in helping us. So I'll point my finger at the man who introduced me, Mr. Frizzy. He'll take a low-case position, but Dan, you were on the alumni board uh, for the university. 
Terry Lee, an accountant, has been on the alumna board for, and Harry White has been on the foundation board. So from a little place over here in the middle of nowhere, we have had some extraordinarily gifted people assist us not only locally, but at the university in general. This is what it looked like, ladies, in the day. And you'll see this quickly. We had fashion. The girls wore clothes, nice clothes. They wanted to be dressed. We had fashion days. Uh, to say the least, I don't know that I would care for that one, but nonetheless, uh, it was still... Uh, today, sorry, any youngsters here? Uh, it's not exactly what you call dress time at the university. Uh, and I hate to say this, but the faculty aren't worth a damn either as far as how they dress. <laughs> so if you wear that to class on the main campus, David, what do you think? Uh, haven't seen that in a while. Haven't seen that one in a while. I'd love to see it because I thought... I always thought you ought to be dressed. You ought to look like a professional. And I thought students going to student teaching ought to look that way as well. Here is one of our, as Danny was saying, we had many conferences. This was during the Vietnam War. So here's your peace symbol. You know, we had one on strip mine coal. We had uh, concerns. We had general presentments for the public. This was the idea right here on the stage. Uh, we are showing a picture of Dysart Woods. It's still a laboratory. We go over there uh, for botany purposes and try and give you a, an idea of what could be seen and, and looked upon. Uh, give me a quick one. So really sweet people. Liberty and Cows. Uh, and also Miss Ebert from Ebert Farms uh, as a youngster. Uh, but Liberty decided that everybody learned how to, how to pour at a formal setting. So she would bring a silver tea and coffee set out here and you had to learn how to hold a cup in your lap with a napkin and eat scones. And that's how we started. All right. Today, if you can eat your McDonald's in less than two minutes and wolf down the drink, why well, it's considered uh, and there's liberty again. Part of the Antalus family had always been supportive of who we were as well. Here's a man that was rather unique. Tom Stubbs. The man from Holodonia, Mauder Brothers store, Vic Greco. He was a faculty member in business. We came up here and decided we ought to teach courses everywhere. Canalco, Ormet, uh, Reynolds Hospital in Cambridge. We went to Steubenville. We went up and down the river. All the mines, Franklin High Wall, Rose Valley. We were teaching the foreman there communication skills and how to write reports because they knew how to mine coal but now they had new kind of responsibilities they had to present themselves in a more professional fashion. Uh, Claude Coleman, Bob Bogenizer, John Vizbachi, Vic Rudder, uh, part of the Brain Trust. Uh, for those of you that never had a chance to have Claude Coleman, your language vocabulary increased monumentally during your tenure. Anybody have Claude by chance? Oh yes, what do you think of Claude? Wonderful. He would give you root words. He would tell you this. Claude had been a cultural attaché first in Egypt, then in Pakistan. So we had some interesting folks along the way. Get going. This is a killer. Adam Jean and Medico, but Castle, who's this one? That's Tom Flynn. Tom Flynn. <laughs> English. He now has a gray beard, and I mean really gray. But he and I are the last of the Mohicans. Uh, Adam taught speech and hearing, and Tom, both of these guys were instrumental in the development of what we call weekend college, where we came out and taught courses Friday night, all day Saturday, every other weekend for a semester. Whoops. Back up here. Larry and Judy Bush, a husband and wife couple at the time, they have since separated, but they were in Nigeria, and on two occasions, and Larry taught mathematics, Judy eventually got into the cultural side. African history, etc. They had a child there, uh, came back. They were part of the crew that was overseas. So there was Claude Colvin who had overseas postings. Sam Weaver, a historian, was in Brazil. Uh, Tom Helms was in Ethiopia. He was in Botswana. He was in Vietnam. And every place he went, they had a revolution. You know, so we kept telling him, damn it, Tom, you know, <laughs> it's dangerous. Where are you going next? But uh, a phenomenal guy. Adam, uh, was the first to try and bring together uh, courses on aging uh, to try and develop it for, we thought we were going to become an aging satellite here uh, and Belmont County, basically with all the rest homes, etc., pretty much fits part of that bill. This is Kate Britton. She's a folk singer from England, as Dan implied. 
we had money from the Kennedy Foundation and the Danforth Foundation. Danforth is Russ and Priyana Chow, the big foundation. We had lots of people. I'll list the names here shortly about all the folks we had come. The only full professor we've ever had here at the campus was Jim Kettler, physicist. Quiet, soft-spoken, phenomenal faculty member. Just a great, great guy. Never said more than two words if he could say one. Uh, that was it. Tidville Thomas. If you had Liberty and Talos on one side, you had Tidville on the other. A lady personified. And a, and a lovely one at that. Here's the Bud Kaiser and the Tom Stubbs and the John Bisbachi. Once again, we couldn't have gotten better support from some of the folks that were in the area. Whoops. There's Tom Helms. Uh, interesting guy. He got married on the back of a hay wagon at the Circleville Pumpkin Festival. <laughs> <laughs> he was dean of the regional campus at Lancaster, and he was simply the greatest guy. I'm missing terribly. Yeah. He was ordinary, I mean, of the highest level, and he infected his students in the same way. They loved him and got in a lot of trouble because of it. But if you're going to a university, shouldn't you have somebody who is a maverick, uh, somebody who is a, oh, ordinary, ordinary, and oh, yes. So here's Sybil, or excuse me, Captain Tedrick, yours truly, and Bob Bovenight. Look who's carrying the box. If you notice, I know how to get around and delegate responsibility. Uh, gave it to Bob. Uh, here is Les White, Director of Adult Education. Bob, this is Mrs. Anderson, wife of Dick Anderson, the bank, Belmont Bank at the time. Yours truly, once again, always can. James Hockey, uh, wife of a man who had been Vice President of Wheaton Pit Steel, and Hoover, student service director. Long, big, tall fellow. Come on. Okay. It's my show, so I'm going to have my picture. Uh, I don't worry about that one. But I took 19 trips, seven of them to Europe, about 10 of them to New York, and about half a dozen or so to Washington, D.C. But I made them take a course. They had to study where we were going. They had to do some kind of write-up, much like Dan's. You had to do a paper, you had to do a presentation, you had to have some background, you got one hour of credit, and I told them where we were going. This group was going to go the three cities. We were going to go London, Paris, and Rome. And we did it in a whirlwind, but I had great times. Never had to send the student back. Never. Wonderful kids from this neck of the woods. Whoa. <laughs> and here is the brain trust. So, it goes this way. Bob Bovenizer. Up till 82. Yours truly, 82 and 83 as Dean. Then comes Jim Newton, who comes and stays for 24 years, followed by Bill Willen, and who is replaced down the road by Rich Greenlee for four years, and finally our current Dean, Paul Abraham. We now will have a new Dean coming in July for a year appointment, but we've been very fortunate between Bob Ozer, Bob Ovenizer and Jim Newton to have almost 50 years of consistent leadership is a phenomenal thing. I mean, it really works rather nicely in how that is done. Uh, that we're still all around and we still finally get together from time to time, it's not a bad thing. So while I'm on a roll, let me do some of this. So I mentioned that we had all kinds of speakers. All right, here's our list of some of the ones. You heard from Dan, we had Dick Gregory. You remember Dick Gregory, the activist? Uh, he came here and talked about civil rights. And it was the first time we'd had a black man on campus. Probably scared the hell out of everybody, you know, whether or not, if you remember, we were very homogeneous here. We have a lot of ethnic groups. We didn't have a large black population of any kind. We had a man by the name of Victor Bono, who was an actor. And he came out and was doing just We Three, famous play, but. He was also in Robin Hood with Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and all the rest of those. We had a man by the name of Reed Buckley, who was William F. Buckley's brother, and was just as sharp. He tells stories. So he says, they had dinner at their house, and their dad would give every one of them ten words. And before they could eat, they had to use those ten words in a sentence. More sentences, that's fine, but you had to use all ten words. And they had ten words every day. So there's 70 words a week. He said, I was a walking encyclopedia. You know, I just had words coming out. I had to look them up, figure out what they meant, how to use them. And if it didn't work right, I got another 10. And it was just, so we had Dr. Yi Chu Wang, professor of history, Queen City College. So time out, 1971. I met him. I'm an Asian historian. And he says to me, Mike, I'm leaving. 
you can have my job. This is back in the day before you had to have faculty searches. He just said, I've got a spot. You can have my job. You can have my apartment in Queens. Three bedrooms. I've got two kids at this time. I'm thinking, well, okay. So what's the gig? He said, $50,000. That was $30,000 and $35,000 more than I was making here. And I thought, I'm in heaven, right? My first paycheck here was $3,300. <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay. I asked Patty, and she says, well, I don't know. Let's go look. So, get up there. He says, first thing you have to do is sell your car. Don't need a car. You just take cabs and move around. Second, you owe $75 to the doorman every week because he's going to watch, make sure nobody comes in the building improperly. Then you got $50 for the guy on your floor to make sure your floor is safe, even though you're in a locked building. Then you have $100 for the guy that's going to buy your groceries at the store and bring them to your house. And that's, then we had to have $75 for the playground supervisor so our kids could go someplace and not get kidnapped. Then, <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, my, my salary kept going down. And pretty soon I said, I'm going to lose money if I go to New York. But I had a job, and it was one of the few times I seriously considered leaving here. Thank goodness I did not, but I thought, wow, could I have really done that? Okay. We then had a, perhaps the most famous of the figures, F. Lee Bailey. The man who had been the attorney who represented Sam Shepard and eventually got him out of prison after 10 years for the supposedly killing of his wife. But he also came down and spoke about the Boston Strangler. So, how many people do you think we had come that night? Somebody said you were here? I was here. A lot. We had 1,100 people. We, had, we couldn't put them in the room. So we had television sets out in the hall. We had people up on the upstairs. We had third floor, second floor full of folks. And... Poor guy couldn't leave. He was here for three hours after he spoke, trying to tell, you know, you sign my autograph, would you give me some information, let's do this. He was supposed to go to dinner, never had a chance. Uh, we had a woman by the name of Claire Chenault, who was the wife of the Flying Tigers, famous author and expose figure who flew aircraft over the hump into China from Burma and parts of northern Vietnam and was famous because he was a volunteer to do it at the time. She was a lovely lady. Uh, we had, as I said, Kay Britton, we had a tremendous number of individuals at one time or another. For the most part, they were an eclectic group of people. They had all kinds of backgrounds coming from every place and anything you might think. We also had uh, some debates. We had Claude Colvin, the same fellow, and Ralph Hatch, and they went toe-to-toe -to -toe on strip mining. At the time, we had the grounds here donated to us by the coal company. After Claude got done speaking against strip mining, we lost all the scholarships. <laughs> they stopped donating money. We were dead in the water. Uh, and I can't deny, Bob never tried to tell him not to speak out. And he flew one of the Udall brothers all over the country in a helicopter. Look at it. Look at that high wall. Look at that big slag mine. Look at that stagnant water. And that pretty well killed us on that side. Uh, needless to say, we had to kind of just take it in, in position. Uh, we had the Arboretum brought forward by a man by the name of Brooks Wigington, W-I-G-G-I-N-T-O-N. He wanted to put out here white pine, red maple, Austrian pine, flowering crab apple, red spruce, white ash, and 400 other trees plus a whole bunch of evergreens. And the idea was that we were going to have all of the indigenous trees of Ohio and all the extras to make it a real Arboretum, like the Newark Arboretum up the way. It was an expensive proposition. We got $10,000 to start it and never got another extra set of monies. Uh, it died the morning, and it was too bad. It could have been one of those fantastic things that you have come along once upon a time. So, I'm talking quicker, I'll get there. So, as we go through the timelines of, we have the Shannon Hall, we have this particular side building, the Science and Engineering Building, built for the Belmont College, to <coughs> test soil samples. They would bring large pot deposits of soil in, in the bottom uh, laboratories, but it eventually petered out and was never easily reclamated to, to make it work and, and take a look. The NACE Center comes along, and for the most part, that has been the idea of the commons on the campus. Do we have other things out here? Yes. When Jim Newton was dean, he had a representative of Gary Player put an 18-hole golf course in here. And we were going to start a program of teaching PGA candidates how to manage greens, how to take the academic courses, because they go to places like Alpena, Michigan. They now go down to Florida. But at the time, there's only one or two schools, and we were going to be the school besides Ohio State, which was up at 
AT&I, uh, Agricultural and Technical, in the north part of the state, we were going to become a, a PGI, PGA center. And when that didn't go, and everybody says, what a stupid idea. What they built? They built Cricket Creek right across the road from us. And so we might have been fine had we done it, but we didn't do it. We also had, at different times, uh, some questions about how would the university expand to citizens that couldn't come. So we had a medical microwave system that was purchased called WOUB, WOUC, WOUC Cambridge, WOB Belmont. And it was a two-way interactive television system. It eventually became a learning network. And we could have sight lines. You could broadcast from Athens to Cambridge, Cambridge to us, over these transmitter lines. We could run classes. So Jay, how many classes do we run now, OULN? 135 hours a week. 135 hours a week, broadcasting it everywhere. Uh, David and I both spend a lot of our time doing what we would call non I have courses in Southern Campus, I have courses in Zanesville, and I've got two students at Lancaster. And David, where are you going this time? I'm at Pickerington in Lancaster. Right and now. here. So right here. it's pretty much commonplace. Instead of dying and not having a course make, we would have a couple of students from this place, a couple of students from that place, and it equaled the course, and we run the course. It's been a marvelous benefit, although you have to learn how to actually handle the microphone, handle the, and I don't, I, I hate technology in the worst way. So as long as I've got him, and I've got Peter Lim, and Trent, I'm good. When they finally go away, I quit. You know, I'll be done. Uh, nobody will want me anyway. So, do we have some interesting folks? Yes. Most of this happens, however, at the beginning. It doesn't happen necessarily at the end. So, along the way, we have had a number of other kinds of things that have kind of come our way. Uh, let me tell you some of the stuff that we can't repeat. And if you say that I said this, I'll deny it. So, uh, when we had the building built, there's a strike. Otis Elevator goes on strike. And we're dead in the water. But all of our desks for the faculty came. And they're sitting outside in boxes. So what did the faculty do? We broke the crates open. These desks weigh about 400 pounds. And we picked them up and we walked up three set of stairs all the way up to the top floor and put desk in every faculty member's office. Otis Elevator find out and said, we're going to strike the entire facility and we're shutting everything down. And we're ready to try and open for classes. What did we have to do to satisfy Otis Elevator? Well, we did. We had to carry all the desks back there. <laughs> 28 of them. 400 pounds of top. We had bad backs, hernias, we had it rear. Uh, it wasn't pretty. So that was one. Uh, I will admit to open statements that Bob Ney is a good friend of mine. Always has been, always was. I regret the, the things that he did as far as his activities. When he was in the state legislature, he was a marvelous uh, aspect of assistance for us here. And I got to know him by doing this. Wayne Hayes had really made a fool of himself with his secretary and came back and ran for the state legislature. Bob decided to run against him. I took my students and I said, let's do a survey. We're going to do a sample. We're going to poll. So we made 500 phone calls. And out of those phone calls, we had 298 responses, enough to do a reasonable sample. And we projected Bob as the winner to the percentage point. Wayne Hayes tried to go to the Board of Regents and get me fired. Bob said, hey, you want to come do some stuff? Let's do some, you know, projects, et cetera, et cetera. I said, sure, fine. So he became a mentor in the sense that he would give me access to all the government offices in Columbus. If I wanted to have a meeting and take my students up and meet the governor, he'd set it up. If I wanted to have a meeting with somebody at the Department of Transportation, he'd set it up. And I had more classes going in Columbus than I had here for a while as far as political science and governmental theory and lobbying the legislature. I was a lobbyist. I paid my fees and I lobbied for something called community education. So one of my functions, Bob says, you need some money? I said, yes. I'm not paying anything. I'm not getting a salary. He said, well, there's a foundation called the Mott Foundation from Flint, Michigan. If you raise enough money, they will match whatever you raise. So Bob put a line item in the budget and said, whatever you can raise, we'll match. So it's a biennium, and biennium means two years, first year, second year. So I got $50,000 from Mott. I got $50,000 from the legislature, and that means I did it again the next year. So I had $200,000. I wrote the grant. I made one small error. When you do these things, you've got to put, 
got to put the language down. I put, instead of biennium, I said per annum. So they only wrote it for one year. So instead of having $200,000, I had $100,000. But I gave the money at the time. It was a precursor to Mark Costi coming into the court uh, as far as juvenile judge, and we used it for drug education. That would be in part of the idea of how we go to all the schools and try and go around and convince kids that they shouldn't do it. Could have had another extra bit of money, but I didn't do it quite right. Then, on my second run, you remember when Ronald Reagan ran for president? Who did he run against? Walter Mondale. Okay. So I am now a television commentator for Channel 9. And I am a political analyst, whatever the hell that is. But I'm <laughs> one. So I come along and they said, uh, AP, wire service says, they picked 20 random sites in Ohio and you got chosen to pick one of them. I said, super. Where? Joe Strazik's garage. Where? What store? Down at Ness. Thank oh, you very much. How many people go vote at Joe Strazik's garage? <laughs> Not quite a hundred, but it's a polling precinct. So I tell my students, we are going to do an exit poll. And I want you with guys in jackets, girls in skirts and hose. It is raining cats and dogs. I mean, it's pouring. We've got umbrellas. We're standing. And you cannot get close. You have to stand outside the polling flags. You can't go inside. So we're there at 8 o'clock. Nobody comes out. 9 o'clock. Nobody. Pretty soon some guy walks out. And says, uh, what are you doing? And I said, well, we're waiting for somebody to leave. We're going to do an exit poll. He says, nobody's leaving. It's raining. What the hell are you doing out here? And why don't you come on in? I said, you can't do that. He says, nobody's watching. Come on. So I had about seven guys and about 11 girls. And we go into the polling precinct. What happened? They interviewed us. <laughs> Instead of we interviewing them, they want to know, well, what's your major? And now, oh, what are you doing? What are you going to do? I know your mom. And it was on and on. So we're, you know, we're screwed. So by noon, we're ready to leave. What was the count of these some odd hundred people? Who got what? How many people voted for Reagan? How many people voted for Mondale? Everybody voted for Walter Mondale. What county are you guys in? Belmont. Democrats or Republican, you've got to remember the story. So I called Associated Press on the phone and said, okay, I've got a report. They said, at noon? I said, it's closed. They, you know, they hit all the numbers. Okay, what's the story? I said, 100% for Water Mondale. The guy said, no, you got it backwards. It's 100% for Ronald Reagan. I said, no, no, no. It's 100% for... Walter Mondale, he says, hold the presses. So at noon on national TV, states Ohio is going for Mondale. <laughs> I got fired from my position as Associated Press news analyst. But I, I thought it was a pretty good deal. You know? I went along. And they didn't ask me the next presidential election, but I got back on Channel 9 air. And uh, Eric Miner and I did this song and dance for years and years and years, and he was a wonderful guy to have me come along. One last story, and then I'll stop away from these. Uh, Jim Bryant was one of our uh, strongest supporters, especially during the tenure of President Payne. So we decided we ought to have programs overseas. <clears throat> Excuse me. China, Japan, and several places in Southeast Asia. So we have one at a place called Penang in Malaya, Kuala Lumpur in Malaya, and Beijing in China, Hong Kong on the periphery, and a couple of places in Japan near Narita, near the airport. All right, so we get a hold of the Japanese dignitaries first. We come to Athens, we go to Japan, go back and forth. The deal is set. But in Japanese custom, what should you do? You got to offer them a gift, and they in turn will respond. And you have to have the gift of equal value. You can't give too much, and you can't give too little. So they decided to give us in Athens, and if you ever go down there, about this time next week, we have cherry blossom trees along the walkway down along the Hawking River. What did we give Japan? Do you remember, David? They wanted squirrels. <laughs> they, 
They wanted indigenous squirrels from the Athens campus. Now think about it. First, first of all, we had to capture the squirrels. We had to make sure that they're healthy. We had to get an appropriate number of guy squirrels and an appropriate number of girl squirrels. We had to put them in quarantine for a year and make sure that they were okay. We had vets, we had to have medical records, etc. That was easy. How do you get squirrels to Japan to make sure they're going to be okay? We had to book seats on the plane. <laughs> not in storage. So we had two squirrels to a seat. That's a true story. I'm not making this one up. So, several of us went along to carry the squirrels. They're still there. Although, they're getting old, so they have an S for replacement. <laughs> I have got a million of these, but I swore that I wouldn't go past a certain time, all right? So, one more thing. Jay, how about running this, and we'll make sure that it kind of goes, and I'll do a, a, a cover statement over some of the things you're going to see. We put this together for the 60th anniversary, and we had a nice presentation and a great following. We raised quite a bit of money for scholarships. Uh, I had the, the, the privilege of putting one out in the name of my boys. I have three sons. I have nine degrees for them, you know, at... Oh, uh, just a marvelous thing, how university is very generous to me. So, it then comes along that uh, you need to say thank you. So, for me, scholarship to this campus would be my answer. Dan's talking about it. Uh, we all kind of like this idea because we got a good start here and things came along. This montage, take about, what, 30 minutes? Yeah, you can just, I can shut it off. Parts, getting parts. It's in order. It's in order. So, we'll go through the years and I'll just talk over some of it. Any questions you want to have, just yell them out because there's no use trying to put this in order. Uh, it's just my talking and my remembering, and uh, I have the privilege of being allowed to forget some of the things and remember some of the others. Uh, anybody? Questions while we're waiting? Okay. All right, here we go again. Catherine Tedrick was just marvelous. She was so good... Athens would call her to know what the balance was on our campus. And she did it with paper and pencil. Snow time when the campus was being put together. Shannon Hall, 1967. Remember, you could only go up so far. Bob looking on the entrance way. We never could get students to walk through the front door. Where they all walk through? They walk through the, the service entrance over here on the right. Typical. 1960s. So... This would be the Arboretum, if we could ever get it going again in this area. Uh, Henry Winkler is the instructor there for a site class. Uh, Steve Genova, in case you remember some of the Valera boys. This is coming down at the dedication ceremony. These three girls also, all for education majors. Uh, Bill Bartles, talking to his student teachers. I should know these folks, but I don't think I can. Uh, flag ceremony coming in. Oh. Bob Bogenizer, Board of Trustees, all the demo. It's quite a to-do. Every time you have a dedication, it goes in this fashion. This is where it, the old lounge was, just a few tables. A lot of people playing euchre. Uh, once again, the establishment lay, waiting for the great... What did the statement come out? That we would be playing Ohio State in football in 20 years. That was, that was the pillar, the, the campus newspaper. The uh, language lab with the headphones. This is the auditorium. Here's that platform I was speaking about. It used to protrude out. We had some pretty good parties. We got student dances. We got kids would stay here and dance. Howard Wish, philosophy. If you hadn't had Howard, you haven't struggled. <laughs> And the struggle was honest, because he liked to see them think. We had Christmas parades. We were Chamber of Commerce oriented, tried to go to all the communities and do these kinds of things. We always had Christmas pageants, Christmas plays. Uh, there was a lot more activity, because there weren't other places to go for the kids. No mall. We got into the sports program eventually. Once again, that same picture of getting... We got, always have had very generous people give us checks for scholarship monies. Uh, all types. 
That's the best picture, right there. <laughs> James Bond, stirred. <laughs> Shaken, not stirred. Shaken, not stirred. Hmm. Once again, still the same kind of lounge, but all that furniture has come and gone. Uh, but if you walk out the far side, uh, one of my gifts at the university was to endow a new lounge. Uh, what used to be the 1787 lounge is now named after my wife, Patricia. Uh, I just decided it needed an uplift. Here we go. This is Patricia. I was a Fulbright Scholar in Japan. We were required to come back and give five presentations. So we went all over the county talking about the Japanese culture that we had uh, placed ourselves through. Once again, that same picture of the peace conferences. Lots of campuses were doing this, especially got hot and heavy because of the time that had happened at Kent State and that it got, remember, Athens had its up, up and down as well. Uh, when we finally got the basketball program, there is an interesting look. Here is David Miles and Henry Winkler. Henry is in sight. David. David put our first computer system together by himself. We had our own local area network. We didn't ask for Athens. We just kind of made one. Uh, the language lab. Oh. Adam G. Amigo that I mentioned before. Same thing. We're getting into a repetitive cycle. Didn't mean to do that. There's Tommy. Uh, he was uh, a singer extraordinaire and just loved to pick up the guitar, sit down in the lounge and just play. Claude Colvin uh, was always into plays. Uh, he loved the theater, uh, both, both here and also at Ogilvy. There's Jim Kepler in the lab. That's Vic Rudder's wife, uh, Carol. Carol. That's the faculty. Uh, Motley crew, uh, but they were ours. When we got to the 80s, these pillars kept rotting. They always had to be repaired periodically. And we're about to change names. We did have a phone receptionist once upon a time. The theater programs have always, more or less, run pretty much through here. That's Pat Murphy, the librarian. The library has since been altered, in case some of you were here earlier. Different angle, different entrance. This is Jim Bryant, the man who took the squirrels. And <laughs> Vern Gray, he was our maintenance supervisor. Lovely man, quiet, never said a word, easy going. We were called the Panthers. That was part of the lounge, the same lounge that's over there still today. Judy Bush and learning services for adults. We tried to have adult learning services, pretty much. That's Coach Figarelli. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, Kay Mansueto and Jim Bryant. Kay was our, one of our early faculty chairs. Dennis Fox. Uh, I had the privilege of sitting on that damn donkey. <laughs> they really liked me. This would become Howard's wife. She was a librarian as well. It's a tough place to mow grass around here. There's just too much of it. You can't keep ahead of it. Uh, Jerry Zambori and Barry Hess, student services. Donna. Oh, Donna, Donna, Donna. Cap is it? Not? Baylor, Nigelbond. Nailer, yeah. Vic Rudder, the story. Kathleen Von Boris, computer science. Sam Weaver, the man who also has had an outstanding career as a, a cultural charge affair. Laura Welk, who became the Associate Dean Secretary, also took classes here while she was doing it. Haven't got a clue. <laughs> Remember, we used to have read it to everybody by hand. One little step at a time. Dick McMahon, the associate dean, specialized in Indian studies, Southwest Indian. Mike Kaiser, the man who taped me for all of the radio shows that I did. And I used to put my courses on disc, uh, cassettes, and then now updated. Uh, you can take my Japanese or Chinese course on a, on a disc. Larry Bush and Matt. Kathleen again. Sam. Kate Tent, 
you haven't had a class from Kate Tennant, you haven't lived. Uh, nursing. Uh, perhaps one of the more flamboyant, flamboyant persons you'd ever want to run into. Uh, we had what would be called spring days, and we tried different programs, etc. Outside, and now I'm losing my hair. It used to be brown, now it's gone. Uh, Art Deptin, a great uh, sculptor. Uh, Jim teaching a class in geography, Tom again in English, Kat, or Kate, uh, oh, I don't know, I'm going blind. Uh, Pozzoli, uh, who was in it, remember we used to have a little information stand right outside the door here? The 90s, we changed our name. Guy almost fell off the ladder trying to do it. <laughs> and we found out while he was doing it that the pillars were rotten, and eventually we'd have to replace those at a great cost. But the students found that they pretty much stay the same, but the dress changes, especially for the ladies. Uh, still doing theater programs, pretty much like you're doing right now, where everybody come, kind of sit, enjoy a program. That's Charlie Smith. We used to teach the history classes. Uh, once again, there's Bob, there's uh, Jack Sarah, Jack Sarah uh, President Payne. Henry Winkler teaching psych course. Henry's one of our early faculty members who died, unfortunately. The weight room over in Shannon, or excuse me, over in the May Center. Uh, if you haven't been there, it's at Shannon Hall. That was the first floor before we changed, but we eventually. Phyllis Wells. If you haven't known Phyllis Wells, she was a back county gal, was a diver. She used to go down the high river and drag out bodies. Let me tell you. John Biswati, who eventually I left us and back to. Uh, Leslie and had a uh, extremely bright student that won the Junior Nobel Prize. There's Governor Voinovich coming to campus. Uh, Zachariah Kurt Ballou, chemistry from India. The wild one. If I didn't have hands, I couldn't talk. <laughs> we still have a award ceremony. We will one this time at the end of May, or the beginning of May. We do it every year here. And our kids like to come to the award ceremony rather than going to Athens, even though they can go through and get the diploma. The award ceremonies become rather significant. That's part of the culture of the campus. And we have days where we just got stupid. You know, we would try anything to keep the students here, to give them something outside the classroom. There's Jim Dixon, President Baker, was the older gentleman there, uh, who had been a uh, Baker Peace Award, a fine, fine gentleman. Uh, Lucian Merzon would be out there trying to hurt us with a little bit of karate. Jim Caseful, psychology. The students keep getting younger. <laughs> Dysert Woods, how big a tree is it? It takes about seven, eight people to a circle. Construction of the Haypack Center, aka Nay Center. A couple of small stories while it's being built. The company that built it. And any new McDonald Douglas eventually lost its license for one or two small things. Number one, when they were building the loading docks, they didn't build them high enough for trucks to drive under into the loading area. And they forgot to put a sewer line in. <laughs> two things. We could have port potties, I don't know. <laughs> We've been having trouble with that roof ever since it's been built. We also now have a scenic view of the prison. <laughs> when it was built, we did it. Technically, this is the front of the building, facing the prison, going out. We thought the students would go out and sit on the patio. They do not. Bob May, the president, there's John Kirk, there's Mike Mormanis, Harry White. 
we had the OU 110 come up, and was it loud, but it was fun. If you haven't seen our band, it's a treat, and you ought to do it, at least once in a lifetime. Cornerstone. I'm surprised they didn't put me in it, so. <laughs> it's really a lovely sight to be able to look out the windows. It's this pastoral scene. It's lovely. Uh, students don't exercise as much as you might think, although we've tried to keep the cost from being prohibitive. Even a small amount seems to deter them from going over. We have a lot of young men that go out and lift weights, but we have a community base that will use the facility and go around, uh, do the walking trail, etc. E.J. Chodzinski. Our Panther mascot, John Prater, mathematician, on the OULN Learning Network. So he's now broadcasting live to other satellites. He can have as many as five cameras or five television monitors telling him where he's being broadcast to. Sarah May Hayes, Sarah Hayes, singer extraordinaire, lovely gal, communications. Joe Hudak, who has since left us to go south where his kids are. He did community health. Anybody look familiar to anybody? This was the day that Jim Newton almost killed himself. <laughs> With Christopher Lorimer <laughs> in a panther outfit. And why they didn't hit a tree, nobody knows. They tried. The new millennium, that's the new gang. It's pretty much us. We're Eastern Campus, OU Eastern. Okay? Sports, academics, community service, public programs. Okay, that'll do it. Uh, questions anybody might have? I've kept you longer by 10 minutes than I said I would. But in general, I appreciate your coming. I hope it was an enjoyable evening. I tried to give you a look-see at the past. I was heavily weighted about myself, my prerogative, since I'm the guy I talked about. Uh, also, I have a special feeling for this place. It's a second home. Just is. I still tear up. <laughs> so, thank you. You know, he talked about the path that's less traveled, and I think that uh, there's a lot of folks who are here in this uh, auditorium tonight who feel the same way as you do. Uh, you know, when I was a student here and I went to a high university in Athens, uh, there was always some feeling that somehow we were not uh, the same kind of student. And we probably weren't, because we were working. Some of us had families. We had responsibilities that perhaps the traditional college student didn't have. But nonetheless, the education that we got here was by far, you couldn't have found a better place to be, to be educated. And I can only tell you that Mike McTague was one of the finest teachers that I've ever had. Uh, I still have my notes from Western, <laughs> from Western Civilization. I still have all the grade books. <laughs> <laughs> and I will never throw those notes away or misplace them. Because when we went, you, you can see the cadence of Mike's presentation. Well, when we would go to class, we would also bring a little cup of water because sometimes we had to douse our pencil to keep it from going, from burning up. We had to write sometimes. But anyway, thank you all for coming tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it. Mike, you've been fantastic. Thank you. We invite you. We'd like to invite everyone uh, into the cafe for cupcakes and some uh, refreshments. And we would like to invite all of you to come to Bel Air for uh, the next uh, lecture series that's going to be taking place next Wednesday. Uh, Erica, where are you? It is um, uh, it's, uh, Jean Feinstein and Judy, Henderson. and Judy Henderson from Wheeling. They're going to be talking about how the other half lived, some of the wealthy uh, people in early America. 
Uh, the following week, we're going to be talking about Rosebeast Rock. How many people have been to Rosebeast Rock? Do we know where that is? Okay, then you all need to come to find out where Rosebeast Rock is next week. Uh, or the following week. And then the week after that, we're going to have George Sideropoulos, Sideropoulos from Wheeling, who's going to be talking about uh, crime in the uh, friendly city. The following week, we're going to do, or we've, re, uh, uh, we've had to reschedule the first on the road lecture series. Uh, Judge Forgiato and I are going to be presenting on April the 4th at the uh, Marion Hall in St. Clairsville, uh, historic Belmont County court cases. He's going to do one. Uh, I'm going to do one as well. So we hope to uh, have you with us throughout the rest of our lecture series. And uh, thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much.